Chinese speaker let's confirm what you English. Ja. Ja, Mr. <coughs> Wang and Mr. Itler, will you please open your camera? Are you hearing me? I hear you. Do you see me? Oh, yeah. Please, please open your camera. We are just... Okay, I thought my camera was open. Uh, we are not seeing you. You don't see me, huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, does that do it? I think or... I don't know if I need to open the camera. Oh, just, just sorry. Is there any? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I think it, it, it will work. I'll now. start. The host has asked you to start my video. Okay. Oh, you can wow. do it now. Yeah. Do you see me? No. Yeah, now. Oh, my, my. Yeah. No, okay. Good. <laughs> oh, there I am. I'm in the box. I see myself. There we go. How's that? Yeah, just uh, let all the panelists start their cameras first, and then we will just start. So. Dr. Batrai? Hello? Uh, sir, Azura, uh, Azura, uh, Azura, yeah, sir. Yeah, sir. Ah. Mr. Wang, we are not hearing and seeing you. Can you? Yes, yes. Yeah, please, uh, on, on your camera. Can you, can you hear me? I'm yeah, speaking yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear, can me? hear me? Yeah. Clear and loud, yeah. It's clear. Yes, uh, your voice is clear, yes, but I'm you are on my camera. Screen. It's okay. I'm on the camera. Doc, I've got a video on. Got no problem. Thank you. Problem, bago. Thank you, sir. Ah, namaste, Doc. Namaste, namaste. Namaste, sir. Uh, good morning, distinguished speakers, fellow panelists, and dear colleagues. I am Yubrat Sowlage, the vice chairperson of organizing institution, Nepal Institute of International Relations. I'll be moderating the session of today. Firstly, let me say something about the organizer. The Nepal Institute of International Relations is an independent, non-governmental organization established in 2019 after being registered at the Nepalese government unit 
concerned with the objectives of doing research for and conducting regular discussions forums on international politics, diplomacy, and foreign relations, providing trainings to the concerned people and to support Nepal government to adopt necessary steps to make Nepal's foreign policy tangible to cope up with the changing environment of the world for the betterment of the country and the people. Since its formation, it has already organized eight webinars and the running one as ninth if, be, if being counted. The present seminar has been, uh, present webinar has been organized to discuss on the uh, topic power politics of the Indo-Pacific region and its impact to the South Asia with reference to Nepal. Our organization believes that the analysis of speakers present in this webinar shall be very fruitful. We will sit for around two hours with this webinar in this morning. Uh, firstly, distinguished speakers will uh, deliver the uh, speeches uh, 20 minutes each. Oh, all right. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, 20 minutes each on the topic. And uh, then that will be followed by question and answer session. Uh, we request all the participants to post the questions, if there are any from your side, to the question and answer box. QA box is right there. Uh, this webinar will be live broadcasted through Facebook page of NIIR Nepal. Uh, exactly, that has been already started. Uh, and uh, the entire program will be uploaded, uploaded to the YouTube channel as well. Uh, now, without further delay, I would like to call upon Dr. Vesi Raj Adhikari, the chairperson of organizing Nepal Institute of International Relations to chair this session. Dr. Adhikari. Thank you very much, Imraji. Welcome, everybody. Namaste. Yes, let's How, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Adhikari. Now, uh, let me welcome to the speakers. Uh, of the event of this morning. Firstly, we are privileged to get an opportunity to welcome from a Prime Minister of Nepal, profoundly intelligent, Honorable Dr. Baburam Batrai. Dr. Batrai, you are welcome. <clears throat> Honorable Dr. Baburam Batrai was Prime Minister of Nepal from August 2011 to March 2013. He is now a senior politician and a well-known Nepali scholar. Batrai received a bachelor's degree in architecture from Punjab University in Chandigarh in 1977 and a master's degree in planning at the School of Planning and Architecture in New Delhi in 1979. He then earned a PhD in regional development planning from Jawaharlal Nehru University, uh, New Delhi in 1986. He has published a number of books related to political economy, world politics and political ideological issues. Dr. Batrai has been a popular finance minister of Nepal in 2009. He has been elected in Nepal's parliament regularly since 2008, uh, particularly 12 and 17 respectively. Uh, in 2015, Batrai left his long work Maoist Communist Party and the following year, he founded new central left party Naya Sakti Nepal. In 2019, he oversaw the party's merger with the Federal Socialist Forum resulting in the formation of Socialist Party Nepal. Again, he architected to merge his party with another party to form new Socialist People's Party where he now holds a senior position. Uh, similarly, we have a, a very special guest from China, Dr. Wang Peng. Dr. Peng, Peng you are welcome. I guess you are hearing me. Uh, Dr. Wang Peng is a research fellow and uh, Deputy Director of the Macro Research Department, Songyang Institute of Financial in Industry, uh, Financial Studies, uh, Renmin University of China. He holds PhD in International Relations. Dr. Wang worked as former research assistant of uh, Tsinghua University Institute of International Relations, assistant researcher of China Institute of Fudan University, press secretary of uh, Tsinghua World Press uh, World Peace Forum and Assistant Editor of Chinese Journal of International Politics. His major research areas consist of international relations theory, 
uh, Sino US relations and Asia Pacific Indo Pacific relations security. Uh, uh, sorry, Asia Pacific Indo Pacific international security, uh, Chinese foreign policy and a strategic uh, culture, and public diplomacy as well. In the, in the past five years, he has published both Chinese and English articles in peer-reviewed academic journals, including Journal of Contemporary Asia-Pacific Studies, Contemporary International Relations, International Political Science, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, furthermore, we have another uh, uh, scholar from USA as well, uh, um, Dr. Dennis Etler. Welcome, Dr. Etler. Thank you. Dr. Dennis Hitler received his PhD in Biological and Anthropology from University of California, uh, Berkeley, the USA, and subsequently uh, taught at the number of colleges and universities of USA. Hitler conducted many years of research uh, and archaeological fieldworks in China in conjunction with Chinese colleagues, and have published extensively on Chinese uh, paleoanthropology. Uh, currently, uh, he administers an online group with over 30,000 members about China-related issues. He is a commentator on political and other China-US related issues on the Western and Chinese mainstream media as well. Similarly, I would like to welcome you, all the scholarly participants, media persons, politicians, diplomatic personal, personals, all from Nepal, India, China, Japan, Hong Kong, the USA, Canada, and different European countries. Uh, European continent, uh, countries of the European continent who are joining in this webinar. Furthermore, we would like to welcome all the watchers from Facebook and YouTube as well. I hope there is going to be a very fruitful morning today with this August virtual gathering for all the scholars, of all the scholars. Mr. Chairman, distinguished speakers and fellow participants, uh, Indo-Pacific region is now in the center of the world power politics as it is the most live world trade route, sensitive armed force region, potential location of alternative world superpower, and world's most stored place of natural resources and the minerals. The downing activities of world regional organizations like ASEAN and SARC, the increasing tensions on the South China Sea, Hong Kong and border areas of China and the uh, bordering areas of China and the growing activities of new pro US organizations like Quad Plus are some of the key features of the changing dimensions of this region. US aid offers like MCC to the small and strategic countries like Nepal, Sri Lanka, Indonesia and the Philippines uh, is another example of the US growing activities in the Indo-Pacific region. Similarly, China has been remaining the single largest trade activist, financial donor, and political player of the region in the recent days. It seems that the Indo-Pacific region is likely to be characterized more by competition to enmity than cooperation and friendship in the future. In the Western Pacific, the rivalry is between the United States and China. And in the Indian Ocean, uh, it seems little uh, uh, different Sino-Indian competition uh, and it will uh, save strategic calculation. This distinct rivalries and the engaging interactions between them are likely to decide the geopolitics of the region. In this context, Nepal Institute of International Relations would like the distinguished speakers to address some important issues following the power political games having been played in the region where we are living now. Will any single nation have the power to map the future of the region so central to global uh, security and uh, prosperity? Can the Indo-Pacific space be used as a shared one for the benefit of, of all the beneficiaries concerned equally and peacefully? Can any country replace China to be the factory of the world as she is in the present scenario? Can that country or even other countries manage the high cost and thereby risk of the replacement? What will be the effect of the small and growing economies of South Asian countries from the increasing tensions in the whole Indo-Pacific region? What policy measures in general uh, should governments of the region take to adapt with such tensions? Uh, being the ultimate neighbor of two recent rival nations, India and China, what may be the ideal status for Nepal 
to work with Indo-Pacific strategies and BRI. Can she go with both of them or there will be the top choices of either of them? The NIIR, the Nepal Institute of International Relations is confident that the scholars would furnish answers to all these queries that certainly would rationalize by the future. Again, welcoming you all here in this webinar. Let me welcome uh, the speakers to deliver the speeches. Firstly, Dr. Dennis Hitler will have the floor. Dr. Dennis, please, uh, you can speak now for 20 minutes. Okay, well, we're, <clears throat> thank you for having me. Um, my um, interest in China and geopolitics goes far back, even though it's not my area of specialty. I'm an anthropologist, but I, I do have extensive uh, experience in China, and I followed uh, uh, China and, and uh, uh, global politics uh, for many years. So even though that's not my specialty, I, I do have some ideas that may be of interest. Um, first off, I'd like to uh, uh, take a look back at history somewhat and, and uh, recognize that um, the Indian Ocean uh, was actually the world ocean. If you go back prior to the age of discovery before the Europeans entered um, on, on the scene, uh, the Atlantic and Pacific were really unknown bodies of water. Uh, they were not traversed until... Uh, we got into the age of discovery and, and the advent of European uh, exploration and uh, you know, later um, uh, colonialism. Uh, but from ancient times until then, uh, there was an immense amount of trade uh, throughout uh, the, the region. Uh, and as I said, the Indian Ocean uh, was the world ocean. You had uh, commerce uh, connecting uh, the Arab region, what we now call the Middle East, uh, with India, with uh, Southeast Asia, with China, uh, you know, down the east coast of Africa. You had um, <clears throat> you had um, you know uh, uh, Zhong He, the great Chinese admiral during the Ming Dynasty, with his flotilla of treasure ships plying the Indian Ocean, making ports of call uh, uh, throughout the region. You had. Uh, uh, Arab traders, you had uh, others uh, throughout the region trading with one another uh, in a mutually beneficial manner. Um, it wasn't a matter of conquest or colonialization. It was a matter of uh, mutual trade um, in goods uh, that benefited all. Uh, and that was the state of affairs for uh, literally, literally millennia. <clears throat> it wasn't until the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries and on, uh, that this started to change with the advent of European colonialism, the conquest uh, of, uh, of lands, uh, you know, in Africa, Asia, and the like, uh, which totally transformed uh, the world. Uh, and um, <clears throat> uh, the focus, particularly in the 20th century, began to shift uh, to the Pacific uh, region and the Atlantic. So you have the North Atlantic Treaty Organization linking uh, the U.S. Uh, with its European allies. And of course, uh, the second theater of, the, of World War II was the Pacific Theater. Uh, and uh, the Americans uh, saw the Pacific as their, uh, their ocean. Uh, and, uh, and they basically occupied it to this day. So you have uh, you know, American bases uh, emanating um, you know, out of Hawaii and after the conquest of Japan during World War II, you have American bases in Guam uh, and in Okinawa. You have our American presence in Japan, in, in Korea, and of course in Southeast Asia. Uh, and you have the uh, other allies, uh, 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 Anglophone allies in New Zealand and Australia. Uh, so the focus of U.S. policy in that region of the world was uh, you know, the, the Pacific region. Uh, and of course, uh, on the other front, uh, you have uh, the Atlantis uh, Alliance, uh, and the Indian Ocean really uh, receded, and uh, its importance uh, was eclipsed. Um, <clears throat> but this seems to be changing now. 
uh, and it's uh, you know attributed to not only to the rise of China, uh, but to the rise of uh, of the whole region, uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Africa as well. Uh, and we're seeing a reassertion of the world ocean, the Indian Ocean, as a focus of attention. Uh, immense amounts of trade traverse uh, this world ocean. And uh, as mentioned, it's beginning to eclipse uh, both uh, the trade routes across the Atlantic and Pacific. Uh, now, uh, what we see in the world today is, as far as I'm concerned, is a rivalry between the two major powers that have emerged uh, early in the century, uh, United States hanging on to its uh, its global dominance, uh, but a new player coming on the scene, uh, which of course is China. <clears throat> and the U.S. is not accustomed to this. The U.S. ever since the end of the war, World War II, where well, they had to contend with the Soviet Union and its allies, but that was a public empire, if you will. Uh, the Soviet Union and the Eastern European allies, uh, the socialist bloc, if you will, uh, was not integrated into the global economy. Uh, they had their their own uh, <clears throat> their own system of exchange, uh, their own alliance, uh, and, and uh, they really didn't interact, uh, you know, uh, in the global market. Of course, they were contending with uh, the United States, uh, you know, during this era of national liberation, which. Uh, basically came to its culmination in the late 50s and 60s and extended on into the 70s uh, and even into the 80s. Uh, so the Soviet Union and its allies supported the national liberation movements, which were uh, <clears throat> a movement to, uh, you know, to end the, the colonial domination of the European powers and to achieve state sovereignty. Uh, so that was a very progressive role that the Soviets played in supporting these movements for national liberation. And the U.S. inherited uh, the mantle of, uh, of the colonialist and imperialist powers of the past, particularly after World War II. Uh, basically, uh, the, the project of containing the Soviet Union that uh, uh, Germany under the Nazis had put forth, you know, much of what uh, you know, uh, the German Reich was about was to basically uh, uh, destroy the Soviet Union and, and uh, you know, spread its Lebensraum into, you know, the Ukraine. Uh, and uh, uh, basically the U.S. took over that mantle after World War II. Uh, but it also took over the mantle of Japanese imperialism in the Pacific region and uh, basically inherited Japan's uh, East Asian co-prosperity sphere. So you can see that the United States after World War II, uh, in that it was, you know, the great victor, uh, took on both, uh, you know, uh, the mantle of, uh, of the, uh, the German project in Europe and the Japanese project in Asia. And that sort of set the stage uh, uh, for uh, much of the second half of the 20th century with the U.S. contending with the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, to uh, an, uh, an extent, China, but China was really, in, you know, didn't have that large a footprint uh, on the world scene. China's, uh, China's economy uh, was uh, a footnote, uh, and um, you know, it was basically a contention with the Soviet Union and its allies. Uh, and of course, then there was the rift between China and the Soviets, uh, which the U.S. tried to take advantage of, and that's where. Uh, this quasi-accommodation between the United States and China came into play. And the U.S. was more than willing to uh, allow China to develop because it wasn't seen as a real threat and, and it could be exploited to the advantage of U.S. corporations as it began to uh, develop its own um, uh, you know, production facilities and industrial plant. Uh, and this uh, fit in well with the uh, with the plans uh, of, uh, of the corporate America. You know, they could extract super profits from China. Oh, of course, it benefited China as well uh, because they were able to learn, uh, you know, industrial uh, techniques and establish an industrial base 
uh, based on more modern technology than what they had inherited, say, from the Soviet Union. It was uh, basically a mutually beneficial relationship that emerged between the United States and China. Uh, the thing is, however, <laughs> China kind of took the ball and ran with it. <laughs> and all of a sudden, uh, the U.S. looks around and sees that uh, China is this rising star in the East and uh, uh, one that uh, might uh, you know, eventually eclipse uh, that of the United States itself. Uh, and um, you know, this was something that the U.S. Uh, couldn't countenance. So what you see now is the sudden realization uh, by the powers that be in the United States that, oh my God, you know, China you know, could actually uh, 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 be, you know, become uh, a larger economic uh, power, you know, and, and a, a, a pure competitor of the United States. And this is nothing that the United States will accept. So what you see now is this, uh, you know, frontal assault uh, against China, um, you know, in every respect. Uh, and it's all, uh, as I see it, uh, purely geopolitical in nature. Uh, any discussion of human rights uh, or autonomy in Hong Kong, uh, the situation in Xinjiang, et cetera, et cetera, uh, are just, uh, you know, smokescreen. It has nothing to do with the real issue at hand. I mean, you talk about human rights. Well, talk about human rights in the United States. Oh, my God. I mean, just look what's going on now. I mean, there's a mass upsurge, uh, you know, because of the abuse of human rights in, in the U.S. That goes back uh, generations, centuries, with the oppression of, uh, you know, American minorities, blacks and Latinos, uh, and on and on. You know, many of the things that we accuse China of doing, we've done ourselves, Uh you know, we, we sterilized uh, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of Native Americans, you know, Native American women. We took children from their families and put them in boarding schools as recently as the 1970s. Uh, you know, we've oppressed, uh, you know, our minorities, uh, you know, enslaved and then, uh, you know, black people. And then, you know, uh, with, with uh, you know, Jim Crow and mass incarceration to this date. Uh, so U.S. talk of human rights is, is just... Uh, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, hypocrisy if there ever was one. And, you know, the U.S. isn't concerned about the welfare of uh, any other people. They have no concern about the people of Hong Kong. <laughs> they don't have any concern for their own people, uh, at least, you know, the powers that be when you look at uh, the situation where we can't hardly even feed our own people, <laughs> where we have soup lines. And, uh, I mean, here in Santa Cruz, and, you know, you go out uh, on a Friday or Saturday, and there are lines of people, you know, 100, 200 people, uh, you know, at a, a food line uh, collecting food for, you know, for the rest of the week. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's really, as I say, uh, a smokescreen for this geopolitical rivalry. Uh, and it's focused now, uh, the focus is shifting, as I said, to the Indian Ocean, to the, what's called the Indo-Pacific, because that's where most of the world's trade is conducted. Uh, and, uh, you know, the U.S. is trying to enlist uh, uh, allies uh, in its contention with China. Now, as I see it, uh, uh, the mantle is slipping away from the U.S. Uh, the, the problems in the U.S. are far greater uh, than uh, people uh, had been led on to believe. Uh, but this COVID-19 uh, epidemic, uh, pandemic, has shown, you know, the... Uh, uh, you know, the rot within the U.S. system, um, you know, the, the fact that it, it can't cope, its healthcare system, its educational system, uh, and its other social welfare systems are on the verge of collapse. And, and there's no coherent strategy or policy uh, to revitalize uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, at a societal level. Uh, while you look at China, China responded uh, in a way that no other country has to this, um, you know, pandemic. And it speaks to the fact that the Ch Chinese society is organized in a way that it can respond to crises in an organized and rational fashion, and the people support the actions of the government. I mean, recent polls by, you know, well-established, credible uh, Western polling, uh, you know, services, uh, you know, Pew and Harvard and whatnot 
show that there is an immense support uh, for the Chinese uh, government and the Chinese Communist Party uh, within China in the range of 80, 90 uh, percent know, satisfaction. So the people, uh, contrary to what uh, uh, you know, Secretary of State Pompeo uh, would like, uh, are fully in support of their government. They see it as their own. Uh, and uh, that's not the case in the United States, uh, where, where our country is riven with, uh, uh, with divisions, uh, you know, class divisions, racial divisions. Uh, they seem to be irreconcilable. Uh, and our, uh, our pluralistic society uh, cannot respond in a coherent fashion to the crises that uh, it confronts, whereas China, having a unitary system of governance, uh, you know, can plan ahead, can implement plans, and, and they can make adjustments uh, in a timely fashion in a way that uh, seems to be impossible in the U.S. at this time and place. Uh, <clears throat> so what I see in terms of the future is that the U.S., uh, I think, is in a panic. Uh, they, it's almost like a rear guard action. They're trying to do everything in their power to derail China's rise, you know, uh, uh, by, uh, you know, taking uh, whatever straws they can clutch, uh, you know, in Hong Kong. Of course, they exacerbated, as I see it, the situation in Hong Kong and China has every right uh, to, um, you know, try to quell the disturbances there. Uh, when you look at what's going on in the United States in a city like Portland or uh, other places, uh, and you see, uh, you know, paramilitary, <laughs> Uh, you know, special forces uh, dressed in army fatigues, going into the streets, beating people, you know, bludgeoning them, you know, lobbing tear gas. Uh, none of this happened in Hong Kong to the extent that you even see in the streets of the U.S. The PLA was never, you know, called into Hong Kong. Uh, it was just re the, the Hong Kong police, uh, you know, were the ones who were on the front line uh, being attacked by protesters on a daily basis. Uh, so, you know, the, uh, uh, we've in, we're implementing martial law in this country. Uh, it was never implemented in, uh, in Hong Kong. In fact, you know, the Hong Kong protests, if you look in comparison to what's going on in the U.S., were freer <laughs> than what we see now uh, in my own country. So all of this nonsense about Hong Kong is just a smokescreen. Uh, and the same thing applies to Xinjiang and all these other uh, bogus issues that the U.S. raises, uh, only to demonize and disparage China, you know, uh, and uh, it's like the, you know, the pot calling the kettle black. And, uh, you know, like I say, it's just a, a means to, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, create animosity to rally the, you know, American people around this anti-China policy. Now, what needs to be done, we have, uh, and I'll finish up soon, uh, we've been living this last, um, you know, a few decades, what be, could be called a Pax Americana, right, after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, <clears throat> the unipolar moment, uh, as uh, it's been called. Well, eventually, uh, as I see it, uh, Pax Americana may be, there's a very good possibility, as the Chinese economy continues to grow, and of course, they have an immense internal market that, that's still developing, you know. Uh, the American market is saturated. The Chinese market is, is really still incipient. You have hundreds of millions of people moving from the countryside into the cities, uh, you know, uh, potential for the internal uh, development uh, you know, of the market in China. Uh, they don't need to rely on uh, the export economy as they once uh, did. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, there is the possibility of a, a Pax Sinica, you know, emerging. Uh, and the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, is the region in which it will uh, uh, come uh, to the fore. Uh, now, the Chinese are not a conquering people uh, like the Americans. The Americans love to go abroad and, and uh, you know, you know uh, we're a militarized society. Uh, that's not the way I see China. They want to... They want to trade. That's, that's their modus uh, operandi, you know, trade, right? Uh, and they want to uh, integrate other countries into their nexus of trade. 
uh, and it can be mutually beneficial uh, for all parties concerned. But the, the U.S. wants to disrupt that, wants to enlist allies to disrupt you know, China's Belt and Road Initiative and, and other uh, uh, ways in which China is trying to you know, spread its wings, so to speak. Uh, and the U.S. wants to clip those wings. Uh, and it's trying to enlist uh, countries like India uh, now, uh, you know, to, to aid in that endeavor. Now, of course, India and China have had disputes. Uh, India and Pakistan, and, you know, the whole region, there are all these historical disputes. A lot of it left over from, you know, the period of British colonialism, uh, which disrupted the, the traditional patterns of exchange throughout the whole region. Uh, we have to go back to those traditional avenues of exchange. There's no reason uh, for China and India to be at loggerheads. There's no reason for Pakistan and India to be uh, these uh, uh, you know, perpetual antagonists. Uh, there's every reason in the world for all of these countries to join together in mutual uh, benefit, uh, to you know, raise everyone's standards. As regards China, you know, it, it has these advantages, um, you know, because of its unitary form of government, uh, and, and ever, and also its uh, realization that a command economy is not the way to go. That you have to have a market socialist economy, and, and that's led to this uh, amazing uh, renaissance in China. If you go back to 1980, if you look at India and and China. Uh, their uh, GDP per capita was the same. You know, it was about uh, you know a few hundred bucks per person, right? The per capita GDP. Uh, but then what you see is that China just uh, took off. So now China's per capita uh, GDP is five times that of India. Uh, the Chinese educational system, the Chinese uh, social you know uh, uh, safety net, uh, its healthcare system, all leagues beyond what we have in India at this point. So India is not a pure competitor of China, and it won't be for a long, long time. Uh, India has to get its own house in order. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, and when you look at the conflict the conflict in uh, <coughs> Ladakh and, and in uh, Jammu and Kashmir and, and the like, uh, uh, there again, uh, you know, it doesn't serve China's purpose uh, to destabilize that region and, and have conflict with India. It's disruptive. Uh, the only party that might be served by having a conflict there, as far as, as, far as I see it, is India. Because, it's, uh, again, it deflects from the problems that India has encountered. You know, China was able to cope with uh, COVID-19 and basically, uh, you know, uh, contain and, and control it. But look at India. India now is one of the hot spots in the world, uh, and uh, it doesn't seem to be ending. Its economy uh, is, is, uh, is uh, um, there's no way other than that it's in a deep recession, whereas China's economy is the only economy that is having a V-shape to recovery. Uh, so, uh, and then there's a lot of internal conflict in, in India between uh, various ethnic uh, groups, between religious groups, uh, intercommunal violence, uh, class distinctions and and the like, uh, you know. Uh, so I see India having it's much a, more a, cause to you know sorry, disrupt sorry, sorry, relations sorry. with China than China. Sorry, as with sorry India. to interrupt you, but uh, we are running out of time. So please sum up within a minute. Okay. Well, uh, I think I've said pretty much everything I have to say, uh, and you know the last comments I have speak to the fact that you know there's no. Uh, there's no underlying reason for conflicts amongst the parties in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, it's only outside forces, uh, those forces that in the past uh, colonized and controlled the region for their own benefit, that are trying to disrupt the integration of the Indo-Pacific region uh, so that those countries can uh, develop independently and solve their own problems and come to uh, a modus vivendi where they all benefit. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hitler. Uh, for your well, thank you for having me. Uh,
probably we are running out of time as we have uh, distributed the schedule because we were a little late to start the program. So that has been just across what we were thinking about to uh, about the time frame. So now, now without further delay, I would like to call uh, for the deliberation to Dr. Ping, uh, Ping Yang. And I think uh, he is uh, traveling. Uh, he was, hello. Dr. Wang. Maybe he is having some uh, issues with his internet. Uh, hello, Dr. Wang. Are you getting me? Hello? <coughs> so, uh, Dr. Batrai, shall we go with you? Yeah, yeah, no problem. I can fill in the yeah. gap. No problem. Hmm. Uh, it would be better if uh, you would speak first. And... Yeah. Okay, 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 no problem. Today, today. Oh, right. Please. Please. Should I start? Yeah. Yeah, please, Dr. Please, please go ahead. Go ahead. Friends, friends, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity uh, to meet with you and interact with you. The Indo Pacific is originally a geographic concept that spans two regions of Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. And that has shaped the image of a community of interest linking the United States and East Asia. The Indo-Pacific region is not only the busiest maritime corridor through which over 60%, that is more than $5 trillion of global trade passes through, but it also houses 10 out of 20 fastest emerging economies of the world. The challenges posed by China's rise have led powerful countries to adopt an overarching approach to ensure a rules-based order in the region from the Pacific to the Indian Ocean, known broadly as the Indo-Pacific strategy. Japan and the United States have adopted a free and open Indo-Pacific as a regional strategy and have sought to give it a form through the quadrilateral strategic approach, or QUAD, a framework for security cooperation among four major democracies, Japan, the United States, India, and Australia. The term Indo-Pacific thus is used expressively to replace the Asia-Pacific, particularly after US security policy was initiated in 2018 for governance of Indo-Pacific region, assigning the front role to India under Quad on issues related to Indo-Pacific security. The Indo-Pacific strategy has emerged as a reaction to China's strategic buildup in the South China Sea and its Belt and Road Initiative, which is a massive design to create a cross-continental geoeconomic and geostrategic space, both on land and sea, through infrastructure, investments, connectivity. Nepal has signed to be a part of Chinese BRI initiative and has already witnessed growing Chinese investment and diplomatic engagements. Given the scenario under development, any country should develop its own independent strategy in dealing with each part of the geostrategic game. And it is quite natural that the country's alliance 
with the above strategy would prefer to advance their national interest first and then think about their allies and partnership later in this context one should not fail to analyze that there was a noticeable progress in resetting the india china relations after chinese president xi jinping and indian prime minister narendra modi had multiple rounds of wuhan and mamallapuram meetings in april 2018 and october 2019 respectively however the recent galwan valley border standoff between china and india has slightly eroded their improved relations with chances of improvement later as both the top leaders have not given any severe commit comment it on their border skirmishes they have various forums to meet and reconcile the differences like shangri la dialogue shanghai cooperation organization brics and g20 were both india and china actively participate we should pragmatically evaluate that the trade between india and china hitting close to 100 billion dollars and their market for supplies of raw and finished products are comparatively big and close by india is willing to be a member of nuclear supply group and aspire fondly to become un security council membership for which chinese supports are imperative this is indicative of how new delhi found it more advantages to stay accommodative instead of allowing it to become washington's counterweight to beijing india in fact only wants to end chinese influence in south asia and to regain exclusive and widespread influence over its other neighbors in the context of nepal following the second official bilateral meeting between nepal and the united states at foreign minister level in december 2018 which was held after 17 years united states officials said that nepal is a part of their ambitious indo pacific strategy a new initiative undertaken by the trump administration that focuses on promoting opportunities on a range of issues across the border pan asian region among two dozen over countries in the indo pacific region not strategy nepal is one of the countries whose third country trade passes through indo pacific maritime corridor and attaches significance for its free passage but can't be associated with the indo pacific strategy unless clarified that it connotes non military alliance nepal as a sovereign and independent country pursue non alignment and believe on resolute diplomacy to maximize the benefits out of these unfolding changes and developments in the bilateral regional and global fronts friends now i'd like to respond to a few questions posed by the organizers of the webinar can any country replace china to be the factory of the world as she is in the present scenario the economic theory says land labor capital technology and organization management are considered factors of production these factors add the worth of the materials and makes ready for global marketing and their costs are set by demand and supply as we know in a globalized world prices are determined by cost competition going through these factors and market connectivity and people's purchasing capacity india and china alone have more than one third global population and themselves are world's bigger producers and consumers thus it is likely that these nations will continue occupying prominent position of factory till these factors will have a cheap production base can that country or even other countries manage the high cost and thereby risk of replacement if we see the history of the industrialization it is moving towards from developed to developing countries and the region where the factors of productions are cheap and markets are, are accessible the wave of globalization has brought about a great change in the global trade trajectory and technology added its value this is an age of cooperation and competition 
despite possibilities of taking a trail risk with high production and manager cost for replacement of the monopoly of certain countries there is equally higher threat of sustainability which is in business generally avoided will any nation have the power to map the future of the region so central to global prosperity and security now economically affluence and militarily mightiness are considered powers to rule the global order security is a requirement for prosperity and there are definitely security challenges in the indo pacific region the continuation of uneasy relations between china and the usa trade wars and dispute in south china sea recent indo china border dispute north korea as nuclear producing country and russia factor as military supplying country continues to be a challenge in the indo pacific region furthermore as the covid-19 pandemic affecting deeply almost all countries in the world at different length and magnitude we need to foresee the would be old order afterwards as it could be proved disastrous or an opportunity for some powers can the indo pacific space be used as a shared one for the benefit of all the beneficiaries concerned equally and peacefully definitely such space could be shared and benefit the stakeholder nations in the region provided it has no agenda behind aimed at any nation it would be easier to conceive the concept of indo pacific strategy and the role of quad if it is further clarified its role in bringing about peace and prosperity in the indo pacific region but we should bear in mind that any balancing act in the region regional security will have a consequential impact on all countries in the region will unwillingly and unexpectedly the issues raise over over the fuel over the flame to create disaster region, regionally continentally or even worldwide the escalating tension between and among the global and regional powers are raising the stances of confrontation at any level particularly in the indo pacific region it would be wise to tap the benefit out of surmounting challenges and there is no military solution whatever appearing in the region and only a mature diplomatic maneuvering would yield enduring solution what will be the effects to the small and growing economy of south asian countries from the increasing tension in the whole indo pacific regions small developing countries of south asia and southeast asia are struggling to craft their course of survival and economic prosperity without impinging on the strategic design of big powers containing for geo strategic space and alternative visions for peace security and prosperity of this region the countries with small economy but with strategic location like nepal would be comparatively more sufferer from such regional tensions if any further the covid-19 pandemic has created gloomy global socio economic and political scenario and with the expected new global format in the aftermath of the pandemic the world may be witnessing a fundamental shift in the very nature of its economy and governance what policy measures in general should governments of the region take to adapt with such tensions india occupies pivotal role and position and has a challenging role to play in the indo pacific region in balancing its relations with china and the usa and even with russia and other powers tactfully enough now india is pursuing issue based policy engagements to maintaining balanced relation with these countries in order to cope adapt and diffuse the conflicting situations arising in the region the stakeholder governments should develop diplomatic capital with a policy to resolve the strains through peaceful means and skillfully handling the challenges unfolding in the region and lastly 
behind the ultimate neighbor of two recent rival nations india and china what may be the ideal status for nepal to work with indo pacific strategies and bri can she go with both of them or there will be the tough choice of either of them with the clarity frication that indo pacific strategy has not any military obligations nepal as a sovereign non aligned nation can benefit out of both ips and bri however it has to develop its own strategic policy based on national consensus to acquire all development assistance from all friendly countries including global powers nepal needs and should maintain cooperative friendly relations with china and india at the same time with the usa as well as other nations but not at the cost of one and others friends we are passing through a very challenging time in human history on the one hand we have made a tremendous progress in human knowledge science and technology and production of well and services which could ensure a comfortable and happy life for all on the other hand climate change covid 19 like pandemics atomic weapons and rising inequality are threatening our very survival in this planet we will either prosper collectively or perish separately the choice is in our hands thank you very much oh thank you thank you dr batrai for your insightful uh, remarks on the issue uh, we are very privileged to have you here with us uh, now uh, actually there are some technical problems with uh, our chinese scholar dr wang ping he was actually uh, uh, he is really traveling traveling maybe through the train uh, so now it's his turn to deliver his speech uh, dr dr wang you have to unmute uh, yes i can see you i can hear you yes can, can you hear me can you see me i can i can hear and see you okay okay Yeah, uh, you you start or you you will go with your yeah you can start i will just uh, try to manage your uh, uh, screens to 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 share your powerpoints i'm just working on it can you start hello are you hearing me okay okay I can see that. Yes, yes, I can see you. Yes, I can see you. I can hear you. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Yes. Uh, may I start now? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, firstly, I have to say very terribly sorry for our other of our hosts, other guests, and our dear audience. Yeah. For since. now i'm on a train in china from beijing province south china well but it may also show night time in china now uh, without too much uh, we think yes the our all endeavor works and now the disease the pandemic is in control we also hope uh, show our best wishes uh, for our nepal and our uh, south asian friends also uh, to make a good deal with covid-19 so the topic i think uh, if, if if you have the, my powerpoint you can see the topic of my presentation today is go understand indo pacific in a chinese perspective um, so here the go here it's not a verb it's i i did the main uh, one move from one place to another here go that's the chinese game we call it wei qi uh it's 
it's relative to maybe the Western chess, but uh, they are playing in different ways. And later, I will show you why I choose Go as a major perspective to understand the Indo-Pacific. Okay, so now my presentation, here are the con contents. Uh, we have five uh, steps. One, introduction from the ground chessboard to ground go board. And secondly, I will talk about the board. What and where is the board of Indo-Pacific? And third, I will say, uh, I will give my comments about the players of the ground game. And number four, the current situation and the general trend in the near future. And finally, I will show my conclusion. Uh, okay, now let's go to the part one. Introduction, from ground chessboard to ground go board. And we know that uh, the former uh, the, the strategist of the US, uh, speaking of Brzezinski, he has uh, published one famous uh, book that's the ground chessboard. And, and to, in this book, he has shown his uh, geographic and geostrategic analysis of the US position uh, uh, during and after the Cold War against the Soviet Union and other major players in the world. And now here, maybe get, just getting insights from Brzezinski's book, I may say, I will, uh, analyze and uh, talk about the Indo-Pacific use the way of the ground go board. Yeah, it's not the chessboard, but go board. Why? Because in the Chinese uh, situation and Chinese history, culture, the Wei Qi, the kind of play, you, um, if you tend to my uh, page four of my PBT, uh, the corner, the right corner, you you can see, yes, yes, that's the Wei Qi. And so you can see uh, it looks very different from chess. The Western Western chess, the Chinese Wei Qi are very, they are very different. And this kind of game, the, in the past uh, 2,000 years, nearly every Chinese strategic, including Mao Zedong, Chiang Kai-shek, and other uh, leaders, political leaders, military leaders, all of them play, they are fun of this game because in their mind, this Wei Qi can give them insights of geopolitical and just strategic training. It's very good. And they show you the art of the Wei Qi, the name, literally, it's a name, uh, it's meaning of the art of siege, the outflank attack. And it may also show you how to surround and annihilate and the indirect approach uh, deep operations and so on. So uh, now uh, the second part, now we turn to the second part, I will introduce my understanding of the board of Indo-Pacific. First, what and where is the Indo-Pacific? Uh, for this question, I have to say, there is only one Indo-Pacific concept but many, many versions. People, we are all talking about Indo-Pacific, but maybe the Indo-Pacific I am talking about is not the one you are talking about and also different from his and hers. So um, for the privilege of, uh, we, we, we make it simplified, we say there are narrow, uh, special version and the general version. Uh, as far as now, uh, I can see that the U.S. Trump administration's version of Indo-Pacific, maybe it's the most narrow one and specialist one. And for the most general one, we can say the Indo-Pacific is con constitu constituted by two rims. Two rim. Rim one is the Pacific rim, and uh, uh, so we can, if we can, we look at the map here. The, Yes, the corner, right corner, uh, bottom. You can see uh, the
Mr. Wang, there is a problem, maybe internet issue. Are you hearing me? Hello? Maybe he's there. Oh, we are extremely sorry for the inconveniences uh, due to the internet issues. Uh, or maybe there is another connectivity issues as well. Uh, Mr. Wang, you're, mm -hmm. are you hearing? Hello? Yeah, he's right there speaking with us. Yeah, we are not getting you well. There is no voice. So sorry. Hello? No, there is no sound at all. Oh, I think I think we have to stop right here with him uh, because we are not being able to hear him well. Dr. Wang, are you getting me? No, we are not getting you, so sorry. Sorry, we, we will stop you here. Uh, we never faced such, such issues before. We are very sorry. Uh, we will share, share the presentation. So now uh, we will go to question and answer a session. And we request the participants to write the questions in the question and answer box. Uh, yeah, he's writing me that uh, he is uh, seeing and hearing me and we all very well uh, but we are not being able to see and hear him so we are very sorry uh, here is a question from uh, a participant uh, maybe this i don't know so whom this person is uh, I'm a Chinese IRD student from Tiwan University. My questions are, will the rise of Sino-US competition have significant impact on the South Asian regional order? Do you have any suggestions for Nepal in Sino-US current worsening relations? Thank you. Uh, so to win this question, this is not clear. So. Dr. Bhattrai? Yes. Please, yeah, please respond to this question. You, you, did you see the question? Yeah, I, I just heard. I okay. heard. Yes. And definitely, definitely, uh, when there is a rivalry uh, between big powers and their strategic game uh, collides in a very sensitive strategic region uh, like. Uh, Himalayan region where Nepal is situated. But that's why I hinted in my presentation, Nepal wants to avoid all such rivalry or geopolitical collision in this region so that 
we can concentrate on economic development and prosperity for the people in a peaceful manner so what that's why i entered when the the bri of china and the uh, ips of the usa seem to be colliding in this part of the region uh, we are very carefully weighing the pros and cons of these two strategies though we are already signed the bri with china and we want all economic aid associated with the bri for development of our infrastructure and overall economic development and we have been slightly hesitant on mcc so far because there is a dispute within the ruling party itself whether to accept it or not so as a opposition party our party has been very keenly following it and not made, made any position so far but as i said earlier we would like to have good relations with both especially china and india and then with the usa and other powers for the development of nepal thank you all right so dr itlo do you have any uh, comments on the question <clears throat> well i would agree with what was just said of course that a country like nepal uh should uh, try to develop uh, equitable relationships with with all countries uh, far and near um and not uh, uh you know play favorites but you know look out for their own national interest seems to be a reasonable approach uh and i would expect nepal to want to pursue that so of course the rivalry between china and and the us uh, complicates it because uh you know, as far as i'm concerned from the us perspective uh, the us will try to uh use strong arm tactics to uh, uh get nepal to uh, you know favor itself uh, over china so i think uh, uh a country like nepal has to be very wary of that all right so there is another query from uh, another participant china really trying to identify itself as a part uh, indo pacific saying it's a political and a strategic concept the dynamic of indo pacific strategy building infrastructure connecting links with geopolitics and geo economic uh, architecture will this indo pacific become a battle field for us china rivalry dr batrai now i wish uh, the indo pacific uh, region won't be a battlefield for rivalry of uh, usa and the china the if you see in history the rising powers have always uh, try to create a new space for themselves and the original reigning powers would always try to retain their supremacy so naturally since the usa has had a supremacy over the region since the uh, second world war it would try to maintain its supremacy and china being a rising power naturally we try to uh, enlarge its own space so there's some collision will be there but we should find a way out it's a necessary uh, that you have to um, compete and lead to war i think there, there are ways and means to resolve conflict through peaceful means through uh, mature dialogue for the mutual benefit of both sides and for the benefit of the world at large is it our pious wish of course being a small uh, nation uh, nepal can do anything about it apart from just wishing that there is no war uh, in the world and peace uh, which would contribute or help for the development of our country uh, but i hope uh, things in the 21st century uh, are different than than they were in the 20th century and we have all learned lessons from a uh, destructive impact of wars uh, so 
I would appeal uh, to both uh, USA and China to resolve their uh, conflict of interest peacefully and lead to a peaceful global order, which will be, which will contribute for the overall well-being of humanity, Nepal included. Thank you. All right. So, Dr. Eatlow? Uh, yes, I, I would wish uh, for what um, uh, the good uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, said uh, to be true. Uh, and that would be, uh, I think, our fondest hope. Um, but from my perspective, being uh, here in the United States and observing the scene for my adult life of uh, over 50 years, um, I, I'm very um, sad to say that uh, uh, it might not quite be so easy for the U.S. to step down from, uh, uh, you know, from, step down from uh, its perch. Uh, the U.S. has a militarized economy. Uh, we spend far and above what any other country uh, spends on its military. Uh, combining all the militaries of all the countries of the world and the U.S. military spending far outstrips uh, uh, that total. Uh, so uh, a, a large portion, a third of our um, uh, <clears throat> discretionary uh, budget, you know, that's not committed to uh, uh, fixed costs like uh, Social Security or whatnot, goes to the military. The military is the mainstay of our economy. Uh, every year we spend $600, 700000000000 billion, and, and that's every year. Um you know, so that amount mounts and mounts and mounts, and it's so integral to our economy that we have to basically engage in conflict uh, in order to maintain, uh, you know, that as a lever to uh, sustain our economic growth. Uh, so the U.S., whether it likes it or not, uh, because of, you know, the systemic nature of the military uh, spending in our uh, country, uh, is committed to the imperial project uh, with 700, 800 bases abroad. Uh, so it, and it pursues an interventionist policy uh, throughout the world, and it has since the end of the war, World War II. So you see the U.S. intervening, you know, in South America, uh, in the Caribbean, in Africa, in Asia, uh, wherever uh, it, it intervenes uh, willy-nilly. Uh, without any regard for international law or the welfare uh, of the people who it purports to want to save. It has no interest in, uh, in the human rights of the countries that it invades. Uh, it does it out of uh, its own geopolitical considerations to maintain its hegemony. So I don't have any faith in the U.S. Uh, in that regard. Uh, the U.S. has, I don't see where the U.S. really has any role to play uh, in the, uh, I don't even like the term Indo-Pacific. Indo-Pacific is a, a, a American, American-centric term because it's trying to link uh, the Pacific with, with the Indian Ocean. Uh, and there's no intrinsic reason for doing that other than to project U.S. power across the Pacific into the Indian Ocean, uh, into, the, uh, into the region, where it really has very little uh, reason to be. Uh, India and the other countries uh, that border on the Indian Ocean can easily solve their own problems uh, and doesn't need the intervention of the U.S. to serve as an interlocutor of any sort. Uh, so I'm uh, rather pessimistic uh, about the role of the U.S. in uh, the Indo-Pacific region, if you want to call it that. Uh, and I think there has to be a total reevaluation by uh, the U.S. as to its role in the world and how it can play uh, a role that uh, doesn't benefit it, uh, only itself, uh, but a role that uh, benefits uh, the world at large. Uh, it says that uh, that's what it purports to want to do, uh, but it doesn't. It works uh, you know, uh, against that goal. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, uh, its words don't meet its action. Uh, and I think there needs to be a total reevaluation 
of the U.S. policy throughout the world, for that matter. All right, I think, right, I think uh, we are, we are uh, on the ease of the program. Now, before just uh, closing, there are a few questions. Uh, one uh, from uh, Facebook Live. Uh, this is to um, Dr. Hitler, and then we will take two, only two questions for Dr. Batrai before the closing of the session. Uh, this is a question to Dr. Countries will respond to US China rivalry. One. Two, is it possible to quad group? There are three questions altogether, Dr. Hitler, to you. Uh, number two, is it possible to quad groups to stop Chinese rise? And three, will this superpower competition is destined to uh, to see the strap? Yeah, to see that strap, yeah. <clears throat> if I get the gist of the question, I'm not quite clear, uh, but um, <clears throat> uh, whether or not, um, uh, could you maybe summarize the question? I'm not quite <laughs> clear what's being asked there. Uh, there's something about the quad, you know, Australia and, and the other members of the quad and the role in, uh, in the region, is that it? And uh, will uh, will it be able to uh, basically contain uh, you know China's rise? Is that the question? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I think that. No, I don't think so. If that if that is the question, I don't think uh, that uh, the Quad uh, you know has any uh, possibility of uh, uh, derailing China's rise. Uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, the Quad you know consists of the United States and. And, um, you know, states that are totally subservient to it, such as Australia, uh, which is not a power. Australia has a population of 22 million. It has uh, really uh, no uh, independent role to play. It's basically a surrogate of the U.S. Uh, <clears throat> Japan, again, is a wannabe power. It uh, doesn't really have uh, the economic heft any longer or the military muscle to play a significant role. Uh, India has its own problems to solve with, um, <clears throat> or to deal with, uh, and um, you know if you uh, put all of this together, I don't think it really amounts to any real challenge uh, to China at this point. It's an annoyance, um, and uh, I don't think it's going to have any real effect in the long term. It might have a, a short-term uh, impact <clears throat> and slow. Uh, China's, um, you know, expanding influence in the region, uh, but I think uh, time will show that it will be uh, uh, totally inadequate to uh, really have any effect on uh, the dynamic rise of China. Oh, all right. So, did you finish? Yeah, that that's pretty much what I had to yeah. say. All right. So, though I have. Uh, uh, told that uh, there will be only two questions for Dr. Batrai, uh, and maybe there are <coughs> some other queries as well. So uh, there might be more, so sorry for that. Uh, yeah, to Dr. Batrai, will there be any political repercussion of uh, current US-China tension, especially closing consulate offices of the both sides in the Indo-Pacific region. This is one. Uh, Dr. Batrai, are you getting me? Do you want to yeah, yeah. call the yeah. questions first? Yeah, it would be better, I guess. Well, maybe you, you just, uh, I, I note it down and then. Oh, all right. So this is one. 
And another one uh, to Dr. Batrai, how do you see MCC in the context of Indo-Pacific strategy? Uh, this is another question. And maybe uh, please respond this to first and then there would be some two more questions, I think. Um, I'll uh, just give a very short reply about the political conflict uh, between the US and China. Uh, they're just expelling the, or the closing the consulate of each other country. I think it is very stupid and in my understanding. The, when the, the whole uh, economy is globalized, uh, technology is globalized, human consciousness is globalized, we're so integrated, um, so fast getting more integrated than any time in history. I think this is no time for the leading countries like US and China uh, trying to close their borders uh, and uh, resort back to narrow sectarian nationalism. I think this is going against the spirit of uh, globalization and overall uh, well-being of humanity. So I hope the leadership of both the countries will realize in time and uh, improve their relations and lead uh, the world or show the way for the world in a very peaceful manner. The first, this is my response to the first question. And the second question about the relations, our approach towards MCC uh, is, as I told you earlier, uh, there has not been a consensus within Nepal on this issue, mainly the ruling party, Nepal Communist Party, they themselves have a big debate within the party and they are not been able to move a formal resolution in the parliament. So personally, in my understanding, uh, if we resolve some of the questions related with MCC, whether it will be a part of Indo-Pacific strategy or is a part of military uh, alliance or not, if it is not a part of military alliance, then my personal opinion is we should accept uh, grants from MCC and invest in our infrastructure, which we so badly need. But the right. ball lies in the court of the ruling party. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Watray. And I think there is another question that is very suitable to you, uh, but uh, though the name is not mentioned. Uh, Dr. Bhattarai, there is another question for you. Maybe I think this is the last for you and there will be another one question uh, for Dr. Etler and then we will wrap up the session. Uh, uh, this is uh, to Dr. The question to Bhattarai, Dr. Bhattarai. While aiming to uh, make Nepal a socialist country, uh, is there any example in the world history of establishing a socialist system with the support of or without a direct struggle against neo-colonial global military powers such as India and USA, which are currently the key players of Indo-Pacific strategy. I guess you, you got the crux of the question. Yeah, this is a big theoretical question. Uh, though I personally, uh, I am, I don't believe in capitalism, as well as the past model of socialism practiced in the Soviet Union and other countries. So we, now we are trying to develop a new model of socialism based on inclusive and participatory democracy, in which we have both, we have individual freedom, political freedom, and social security or in which both market and state have a role and in which the individual and society have a role. So in that sense, new type of socialism is needed in the 21st century. And as per the query, whether this can be achieved without fighting new colonialism, definitely we have, to, we have to fight against Capitalism, we have to fight against colonialism, any type of colonialism, neocolonialism or direct colonialism. Uh, but the, our model of socialism should be different 
from the one practiced in Soviet Union and other countries in the 20th century. So this is what we are trying to do through the People's Socialist Party in Nepal. Uh, only time will tell whether we will succeed or not. Thank you. I think now we should conclude. Go ahead. Actually, there is no electricity in my in the area of host, so there is some problem. Uh, this is fluctuating. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Dr. Batray. And uh, maybe there is another question, and that goes to uh, Dr. Adler. No. Dr. Adler, are you getting me? Maybe? Yeah, I'm here. No, I'm not. The global political order of the sovereign national state seems to be problematic in this era in solving global political problems that include environmental danger, internal political turmoil, and the refugee crisis. What do you think does the United States new liberal government uh, governmentality uh, can address the uh, poly, uh, global political problems in the time of emergency of global power in Asian countries, uh, Asian continent, such as China? Do you see the possibility of the shift of global power in the post COVID political situation? <clears throat> okay, uh, uh, as far as the US is concerned, there has to be a total Reevaluation of our role um, in the world, as well as a reevaluation of our own domestic policy, to address the you know the problems that we all confront. Uh, there are forces uh, in the Democratic Party, which I am not a member of and and, and don't support uh, in uh, you know to any great uh, degree. But uh, there are forces in the Democratic Party that seek to address you know. Uh, environmental, you know, problems, uh, problems of climate change, problems of income inequality, and the like, um, and whether or not uh, that can be accomplished, uh, given uh, our economic and, and political system is 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 questionable. There are many forces arrayed against, you know, uh, policies of that sort, uh, and uh, we've seen over the last uh, few decades that. Uh, uh, these problems have become intractable. So even though you might have the best of intentions uh, and function within the established political order, uh, it's not always clear that uh, those problems can really be uh, addressed uh, to the um, you know, degree that they, and in the fashion that they must be. Uh, so uh, that's a big question. Uh, it has to be uh, basically a mass movement uh, in the country uh, to force the politicians to respond in an appropriate way. So uh, the people themselves have to organize uh, independent of the parties uh, to basically uh, force them to respond. Uh, the parties themselves uh, are not the vehicles for change. It's the people, you know, mobilizing uh, and uh, forcing the par par parties to respond to those concerns. Uh, <clears throat> uh, hopefully, the American people's <laughs> consciousness is being raised, and uh, they will have that um, that impact. Uh, but there again, as I said, time will tell. Uh, was there another part to the question? Oh, right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, <clears throat> all the speakers. And we are very sorry that uh, we could not be able to manage uh, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, fulfill all the, uh, uh, maybe all the um, speeches by uh, Dr. Wang from China. Uh, and we are very sorry for the panel, uh, panelists and the uh, participants uh, for uh, the connectivity issue of today. Actually, we never 
encountered such issue before. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, we thank all the panelists and participants. And now, without further delay, we thank you all. And I would like to re request the chair of the session, Dr. Rishi Rajadikari, uh, for the uh, for the conclusion of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Namaskar, everybody. Speakers: Dr. Barbara Bhattrai, former Prime Minister of Nepal; Dr. Dennis Sattler, University of California, USA; Dr. Peng Wang, Renmin University, China. Other distinguished personnel with expertise and interest in foreign policy, geopolitics, security, and diplomacy in the Indo-Pacific and South Asia region. Friends from media, my colleagues at NIIR, a very good morning. It is delightful to see you and listen to your erudite speeches, which are of immense importance to us. I'm thankful to all of you for your active participation and contributions in the preceding deliberation. These views have been shared and much has been discussed this morning on the issue of power and politics of in South in Indo-Pacific region and South Asia. I would not prefer to repeat it. Meanwhile, I must share that geopolitics and geoeconomics are shifting from Europe, Asia to Asia, Europe, USA to Asia. The ante is up against amongst major power stakeholders such as US, China, India, Japan, Australia, and Asian region. Indo-Pacific is a hub of global trade and energy supply. Two third container trade passes through it and China, India, Japan are dependent on this route where two maritime chokes, Bel Al Mandeb and Malacca are situated. This is thus the lifeline of their economy, peace and prosperity and a matter of life and death for them. However, there, are, there seems to be growing sign of disturbing activities from global powerful countries which are destined to bring disaster of an unimaginable scale in the region. South Asia and Nepal are not immune to the negative impact any disturbance would have on the, on the countries. None of these countries tolerate any disturbance in the balance that hinges on the mutual respect and understanding amongst all stakeholders. Once again, I thank you all and close this morning's important webinar. We will meet soon over other important issues. I request for your support in NIR's future endeavors. Thank you all very much. <clears throat> thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. It was an honor to participate. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vatroy, Dr. Hitler. See you again. <laughs>